Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel and the May 2023 edition of Archaeology News, where I, Rachel, an archaeologist, cover all the latest interesting things going on in the world of archaeology. This show presents archaeological stories from all over the world, including discoveries, current events, and entertainment. Today, I also have a special announcement at the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. All the links for further details on the stories mentioned today will be in the description below if you'd like more info on them. Before we begin, please help support my channel by subscribing, and if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up to help me out with the algorithm. Okay guys, let's dig in. We have seven stories today in our Top Discoveries segment. They are presented in chronological order, starting with a new genetic study on migrations to the Americas during and after the Ice Age, and going all the way up to 1912 with the announcement of a new digital scan of the Titanic wreck. Heading first to the American continents, a new genetic study has found that some of the first humans to arrive there came during and after the last ice age in two distinct migrations from what is now China. During the second migration, the same lineage of people settled in Japan, which could help explain similarities in prehistoric arrowheads and spears found in the Americas, China, and Japan. It has previously been thought that ancient Siberians who crossed over a land bridge linking modern Russia and Alaska were the sole ancestors of Native Americans. However, more recent research has revealed that more diverse sources from Asia could be connected to an ancient DNA lineage responsible for founding populations across the Americas. In this study, the research team from the Kunming Institute of Zoology in China combed through over 100,000 modern and 15,000 ancient DNA samples to find 216 contemporary and 39 ancient individuals who come from this particular lineage. Through analyzing the mutations, looking at the sample's geographic locations, and using carbon dating, they were able to reconstruct the lineage's origins and expansion history, revealing the two migration events. The first was between 19,500 and 26,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum. The second occurred during the melting period between 19,000 and 11,500 years ago. During the second migration, scientists found a surprising genetic link between Native Americans and Japanese people, particularly the indigenous Ainu. Questions still remain as to what specific part of Northern China these ancient people came from and what motivated them to migrate. Now we go a bit farther east to modern day Iraq, where researchers have published evidence suggesting that ancient Mesopotamians kissed romantically 1,000 years earlier than previously thought. Although research has suggested that friendly or familial kissing was a common behavior between humans across time and geography, romantic sexual kissing was not previously thought to be culturally universal. A previous hypothesis suggested that the earliest evidence of kissing came from what would be modern-day India in 1500 BCE. This new evidence suggests that kissing was practiced in some of the earliest Mesopotamian societies and documented in ancient texts from 2500 BCE that have been largely overlooked until now. These texts suggest that kissing was something that married couples did, and it was also seen as part of an unmarried person's desires when they were in love. Therefore, the researchers concluded that kissing could not be regarded as a custom that originated exclusively in any single region and spread from there, but rather appears to have been practiced in multiple ancient cultures over several millennia. We head now to Israel, where a new analysis of ancient feces containing the world's oldest example of the parasite Giardia duodenalis has been published in the journal Parasitology. The fecal samples were taken from two Jerusalem latrines dating to the biblical kingdom of Judah. The presence of these parasites suggests that dysentery was endemic in Judah at this time. Dysentery describes intestinal infectious diseases caused by parasites and bacteria that trigger diarrhea, abdominal cramps, fever, and dehydration, which can be fatal, especially in young children. It spread through contaminated drinking water or food and was potentially a big problem in early cities of the ancient Near East due to overcrowding, heat, and flies, and limited water available in the summer. The fecal samples came from the sediment underneath toilets found in two building complexes excavated to the south of the old city of Jerusalem. They date back to the 7th century BCE, when Jerusalem would have been a flourishing political and religious hub of between 8,000 to 25,000 residents. Both toilets had carved stone seats, almost identical in design, a shallow curved surface for sitting with a large central hole and an adjacent hole at the front. 
toilets with cesspits from this time are relatively rare and were usually made only for the elite. One was from a lavishly decorated estate surrounded by an ornamental garden. The other toilet comes from the House of Ahil, an upper-class domestic building made up of seven rooms. The team investigated the samples by applying a biomolecular technique called ELISA and tested for entamoeba, giardia, and cryptosoridium, three parasitic microorganisms that are among the most common causes of diarrhea in humans. Tests for entamoeba and cryptosoridium were negative. However, those for giardia were repeatedly positive. Previous work has also shown that users of ancient Judean toilets were infected by other intestinal parasites, including whipworm, tapeworm, and pinworm. Lovely. In our next story, the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities held a press conference in May to announce the discovery of the largest and most complete mummification workshop ever found, as well as the discovery of decorated tombs at Saqqara, the necropolis used throughout the history of Egypt from the Old to the New Kingdoms. Interestingly, it was found that one of the workshops was used for embalming people and the other for animals. Both date from the end of the 30th dynasty between 380 to 343 BCE and the beginning of the Ptolemaic era. The embalming workshop for people consists of a rectangular mud brick building with several chambers containing beds. Archaeologists also found a number of ceramics, tools, ritual vessels, and a large amount of linen and black resin that would have been used during the embalming process. The workshop for animals is also a rectangular mud brick building, which was divided into several chambers and halls with a central entrance lined with a limestone floor. Excavators found numerous ceramic vessels and animal remains, in addition to specialized tools for animal embalming. Also announced during the press conference was the discovery of two tombs. The first belonged to an official from the fifth dynasty who was called Ni Hezbast Pa, who held important religious and administrative titles such as Grand Overseer of the South and Priest of the Gods, Horus and Mot. The second tomb belonged to a person from the 18th dynasty who was called Menjebu. The individual held the title of Priest of the Goddess Kadesh, a foreign deity of Canaanite origin. Among the artifacts found during excavations are a group of stone statues of a person named Ni Suhanu and his wife as well as wooden and stone statues portraying an individual named Shepsiskov. Also uncovered are Osiris statuettes, fragments of city seals, parts of a shroud, a human-shaped polychrome wooden coffin from the end of the New Kingdom, and various ceramics, some of which contain ancient Egyptian goat cheese from 600 BCE. Going north now to Italy, the remains of two people believed to have been killed by an earthquake that accompanied the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE have been found in the ruins of Pompeii. The skeletons are thought to belong to two men in their mid-50s and were found during excavations at the Insula dei Casti Amanti. The skeletal remains were found beneath a collapsed wall. Bone fractures indicate the men probably died as a result of multiple injuries sustained as the building they sought refuge in caved in during an earthquake that struck the city in the early stages of the volcanic eruption. One of the victims is thought to have raised his arm in an attempt to protect himself from the falling wall. Beads from a necklace and six coins were also found in the same room. This is the first time since 2020 that human remains have been discovered at Pompeii. Moving east to Cambodia, archaeologists from the Apsara National Authority have uncovered over a thousand artifacts from the Angkor era during excavations at the Angkor Archaeological Park. Stretching over 400 square kilometers, the park contains the remains of several capitals of the Khmer Empire from the 9th to the 15th century CE, including the Temple of Angkor Wat, Angkor Thom, and the Bayon Temple. The Khmer Empire, also known as the Angkorian Empire, is believed to have emerged in 802 CE and at its peak ruled over most of Southeast Asia and parts of Southern China. Archaeologists conducting excavations at an ancient temple near Sra Srang have uncovered 1,055 artifacts, including 103 contemporary works of art made from metal and Buddha statues. Metal statues developed from around the 12th century in this period, but more study is needed for better understanding of them. The excavations at the site have finished and the artifacts are currently being cleaned, repaired, and preserved. Our last discovery for today takes us to the coast of Canada, where the first full-size digital scan of the Titanic has been created using deep sea mapping. It provides a unique 3D view of the entire ship. 
While the Titanic has been extensively explored since it was first discovered in 1985, it's so big and it's so deep down that cameras could only ever record small snapshots of the decaying ship, never the whole thing at once. The new scan captures the entire wreck as it lies in two parts, with the bow and the stern separated by around 800 meters and is surrounded by a huge debris field. The scan was carried out in the summer of 2022 by Magellan Limited, a deep sea mapping company and Atlantis Productions, who are making a documentary about the project. Remotely controlled submersibles spent more than 200 hours taking more than 700,000 images from every angle, allowing them to create an exact 3D reconstruction. The depth of almost 4,000 meters and the sea currents presented a challenge to the team, more so when considering that they were not allowed to touch anything so that they wouldn't damage the wreck. Another challenge was that they had to map every square centimeter, even the uninteresting parts. For example, on the debris field, they had to map the mud in order to fill the space between the interesting objects. It is hoped that studying the scans could offer new insight into what happened to the Titanic on that fateful night in 1912. Despite what is shown in films, the character of the collision with the iceberg is not fully understood. Additionally, studying the stern could reveal the mechanics of how the ship sunk to the seafloor. The sea is taking its toll on the wreck as microbes are eating away at it and parts are starting to disintegrate. Historians are well aware that time is running out to fully understand this maritime disaster. The scan is beneficial in that it now freezes the wreck in time and will allow experts to pour over every tiny detail to answer their questions. That's it for our top discoveries. Now we're going to move on to current news and events. First, we have some concerning news that archaeologists at the ancient Tequesta site in Miami, Florida, are getting sick due to contaminated ground and a lack of proper health and safety protocol. At least three archaeologists have reported health concerns after being exposed to arsenic, tungsten, mercury, benzene, and other harmful chemicals at the site. Three separate Occupational Safety and Health Administration complaints have been filed, two against archaeology firm PaleoWest and one against related group, a luxury condominium developer which owns the site and is developing it. The investigations are open and ongoing. The contentious and controversial project has spanned more than two years and has uncovered over a million artifacts dating back to a more than 2,500-year-old Tequesta marketplace. A long-awaited vote to preserve the ancient indigenous market site was delayed in April by the city's Historic and Environmental Preservation Board. They are now expected to make a decision in July. If the designation is approved, related group would be required to preserve all or a portion of the site and exhibit the artifacts in a public space while highlighting the archaeological and historical significance. The site has been marred with problems from the start, causing environmental and health issues for archaeologists, including fainting, nausea, rashes, and compulsive sneezing. As a former location of standard oil refinery tanks, the possible presence of harmful chemicals like cancer-causing benzene have been both a cause for concern and questions. As a result, the archaeologists were required to take a health and safety training course, and OSHA stopped the digging at the site twice to conduct tests of the soil material. According to an archaeologist who worked at the site and requested re to remain anonymous out of fear of retaliation, the soil was sandy and thin, with no insects, and after just a few inches of digging, they hit the aquifer a giant system of connected porous limestone that all water flows in and out of. To continue digging, they would pump the water out, giving them less than an hour before the water filled back up, spreading the pollutants and exposing the workers in the process. While working in the pits, the archaeologists said management encouraged workers to stick their upper torso through the holes, hang from their knees to get to the bottom of them, and dig out every last bit of freshly wet dirt. She recalls feeling nauseated and being unable to eat and she experienced stomach pains, headaches, and coughing and sneezing. She was quickly moved to another section of the dig, but was coincidentally let go without cause after voicing her health concerns. Her blood work eventually came back with above normal levels of tungsten. This is just one alarming example of several similar incidents. Accusations have been made of the developer trying to cover up and underplay the value of what is being discovered here. As the story continues to develop, I will keep an eye out and update you. Hopefully raising awareness will benefit the site and the people excavating it. Next, we go to Greece, which has recovered hundreds of looted artifacts after a legal battle with the company of a British antiquities dealer, Robin Symes, who had amassed thousands of pieces as a part of a network of illegal traders. Now, after a 17-year legal battle, 351 objects dating from the Neolithic period to the early Byzantine era 
from Stein's collection will be repatriated to Greece. The illegally exported items include an early Cyclotic figurine dating to between 3200 and 2700 BCE, a damaged marble statue of an archaic Cora from 550 to 500 BCE, and the torso of a larger than life-sized figurative bronze statue depicting a young Alexander the Great, dating to the second half of the second century CE. The oldest item was an anthropomorphic figurine made of highly polished white stone from the fourth millennium BCE. Next, we head to the shores of Loch Tay in Scotland, where local volunteers have started to build a replica Iron Age roundhouse in what will mark a rising from the ashes for one of Scotland's best loved living history museums. In June 2021, the Scottish Cranog Centre suffered a devastating blow when its replica roundhouse burned down in just six minutes. A unique open air museum, it offers visitors the chance to take part in Iron Age crafts, such as weaving and pottery, as well as continuing the serious archaeological work of local Cranog excavation. Cranogs are houses built on stilts over water, usually with a bridge connecting them to the shore. The cause of the blaze has not been determined, although police have ruled out anything suspicious. After an outpouring of local and national support, the centre is rebuilding on a new site directly across the loch. The plan is for volunteers to finish building a land-based roundhouse over the summer, and for construction of a new Cranog over water to begin in the winter. As with the original museum, which remains open at this time, the new site will include a replica Iron Age village with demonstration shelters for cookery, metalworking, weaving, and woodcraft, as well as eco-friendly modular buildings for a new cafe, museum, and shop. I have actually been to and even volunteered at the Cranog Centre before, so I can personally attest to the passion of this staff and how amazing this project is for them, and I'm really excited to watch them as they go on to this next phase. We're going to close our program today talking about archaeology and entertainment and pop culture. The Netflix depiction of Cleopatra on the series African Queens is still ruffling feathers across the world. But instead of repeating what I've already said about it, I thought instead I would bring to your attention a new book published by Dr. Jane Draycott about Cleopatra Selene, the only child of Antony and Cleopatra to survive to adulthood, marry, and have children. Dr. Draycott is a Roman historian and archaeologist based at the University of Glasgow. This one is definitely on my to-read list. Last but definitely not least, we have the world premiere of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny at the 76th Cannes Film Festival on May 18th, 2023, exactly 15 years after the Cannes premiere of The Crystal Skull. Scheduled to be released in the UK on June 28th and the US on June 30th, the film received a five-minute standing ovation, but mixed reviews from critics. Disney has confirmed that the film will indeed be the last in the current franchise. Now for my special announcement. I've decided that to celebrate the release of the last film in what is the most recognizable archaeology franchise in the world, I will be doing a special series of Indiana Jones-themed videos on my channel in June. Starting on the 9th, I will be releasing a video every week analyzing the archaeological authenticity in each film, including the aforementioned Crystal Skull, which I honestly haven't watched since it came out 15 years ago, and there is a reason for that. My plan is also to go see the film on opening night so I can have a review for you as soon as possible after it comes out. All right, everyone, that's everything for the May edition of Archaeology News. I hope that you've enjoyed this edition. If you have any stories you think should be featured on the next month's show, feel free to send them to me via DM on Instagram or comment down below. Before we finish, don't forget to subscribe, especially if you're interested in the Indiana Jones content I'll be releasing this month. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!